We are starting a whole brand new series today, right across all of our congregation services. And I know <clears throat> Pastor Sam Chester and T- Pastor Tanya Chester also send you their greetings. Um, they have a close friend who's dedicating their baby today, um, who's planted a church and they've gone to support this beautiful opportunity to celebrate this child. So they'll be back with us next Sunday. The series that we're starting is called More Like Jesus. And it's a whole series on relationships because God cares about our relationships because He cares about us. And relationship is God's idea. He thought it up. (laughs) The repeated testimony of the Bible is that God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit exist in perfect relational harmony. One God, three persons. And God made us for relationship. You might have had a relationship that left you heartbroken. You may have had friends or family members that have betrayed or abandoned you or cut you off. You yourself might recognise that you've made mistakes and have hurt people that you care about deeply. You might be so deeply lonely right now, even those of you who are married. And you've told no one and no human being would ever be able to tell or even guess, but God knows. And He knows it's no accident that you're here today. There was someone who Pastor Phil and I had the privilege of ministering to in our 8.30 service and this was just the message for them through what they were facing. God wants to speak to each one of us today. You know, there's a beautiful verse in Proverbs 18, 24, just the last bit of the verse, it says, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Isn't that a beautiful verse? Because it's actually talking about Jesus. It's talking about His faithfulness. It's talking about His the intimate knowledge He has of each one of us, that there is a friend. You know, there's people who let us down. (laughs) We let people down, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. His name we know is Jesus. The famous preacher Charles Spurgeon said it so well in a message he gave on this exact verse. Now you gotta just go with the old school language, all right? Because there's gold in here. But he said, before aught of creation had struggled from the womb of nothingness. He's basically saying before the world was created. (laughs) God, even our God had set his heart upon all his children. Since that time, once has he once swerved? Has he once turned aside? Once changed? No. You who have tasted of His love and know His grace will bear me witness that He has been a certain friend in uncertain circumstances. I want us to do something a bit different this morning. If you have experienced Jesus being a faithful friend, can you put your hands together and give Him a clap of friend? Come on, right across this place. Come on, not a small thing. His faithfulness to us, His friendship with us. There's so many people who could stand up in this room and testify of His goodness. God has set His heart on you. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus is the most trustworthy friend. He sees the good, the bad and the ugly of our thoughts and our desires and our actions. And yet, somehow He still wants a personal relationship with us. And it still amazes me It amazes me that Jesus invites us through His work on our behalf. He invites us into communion with Father, Son and Holy Spirit, into this beautiful relationship, this perfect relationship. He says, no, 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 you can come and be part of this. Isn't that awesome? Jesus Christ left the beauty of heaven and came down, down, so far down. that He was born in a cradle in the dirt. We sang about it this morning. He entered the sin-stained and heartbreakingly broken and dark world that we know. He came to come and rescue us. 
and only by His perfect sacrifice, His willing death, the crucifixion that He endured on the cross and His victorious resurrection. He has made, He Himself has made it possible for unholy, (laughs) undeserving, ungodly, messy, selfish people like me to know God as my heavenly dad. Wow. To be a friend of God and a citizen of heaven, to know whose I am and whose I belong to. And if you don't know Him like that and you're watching online or you're here today, you can begin a brand new relationship with God, the God who made the universe, the God who spoke and the stars came into being. He wants you to know Him personally. You can know the friend who sticks closer than any imperfect blood relative, any doesn't have it all together marriage partner, (laughs) any human friend. But the cool thing is that God doesn't stop there. I mean, that's pretty crazy good enough. I mean, we could spend a lot of time on that. That's amazing. That's everything that He's done for us. But He doesn't stop there. He's designed us to continually learn how to relate to others, how to receive love and how to give love in relationship with people around us. And I'm not just talking about, you know, people that are like immediate family members or um, people we live with in our household. I'm talking about that He wants us to learn how to love our neighbour. And who is our neighbour? Our neighbour is everyone we bump shoulders with. (laughs) Our work colleagues, our uni mates, our school friends, you know, that extended family member that drives us up the wall. (laughs) You don't have any of them. People we rub shoulders with, the strangers he brings across our path. And here's where we often run into roadblocks and obstacles. If you're a teacher, you don't use the word roadblocks and obstacles, you use the word growth mindset. I have a husband who's a teacher and you've got to come at it from a positive angle. So whether you see it as an obstacle or a challenge or a growth mindset opportunity, that's okay. (laughs) People are not always easy to love. Did you know that? (laughs) They're not always easy to interact with. Human relationships are messy. People can be seriously frustrating, hard to get along with, annoying, selfish and downright rude. I mean, have you driven on the streets of Adelaide lately? Kids know this. I love how honest kids are. They tell it like it is, which is pretty funny. Um sometimes. <laughs> like this poor mum I read about this week who says, I told my kids that we're no longer saying shut up because it sounds mean and it can hurt people's feelings. So my kids are getting creative with their use of words. My nine-year-old daughter was talking and talking and my six-year-old son who couldn't take it anymore and was trying to find somebody who could say that was not shut up said, silence you peasant. <laughs> I don't know where he got that from, that's hilarious. I don't know which is worse, but anyway. Left to our own devices, all of us can be seriously frustrating, annoying and downright rude, right? And I wanna say from the outset that some of us have experienced relationships where, relationships that have been abusive. And it's really important that we frame this series by talking about that or paying, giving you know the context for that because Sometimes there have been people we trusted who've become abusive. And it's right and important to draw boundaries on unacceptable behaviour for our own safety and the safety of others. The Bible and Jesus himself never condones abusive, violent or destructive behaviour. And so if you are in a situation where that is happening to you, please tell someone that you trust. You don't have to keep living in that situation. You can even have support so you can make choices about what you want to do next. The good news is that Jesus, our faithful friend, is ready to wade right in and help in all the messiness. He offers wisdom, hope and help for relationships 
and for individuals. When we feel stuck, when we feel strained, when we feel like our relationships are broken or bruised, He wants to help. He longs to carry our burdens and comfort aching hearts. And He's here with us today. And Jesus navigated relationships perfectly. You might be thinking, yep, He was God. Of course He did. (laughs) Jesus has got the goals. When He walked this earth over 2,000 years ago, He demonstrated God's ultimate design for healthy interactions. When we look at Jesus, we see what God intends, you know, perfect human interaction to look like. In Romans 8, 29 to 30, in the message paraphrase, it says, God knew what He was doing from the beginning, from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love Him along the same lines as the life of His Son. The Son stands first in the line of humanity He restored. And we see the original and intended shape of our lives there in Him. After God made that decision of what His children should be like, He followed it up by calling people by name. He knows your name. He knows your name. He knows where you are right now. And after He called them by name, He set them on a solid basis with Himself. And then after getting them established, He stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what He'd begun. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke or John, I do know what the gospel, <laughs> the names of the, the gospels are, just had a momentary blank. Um, but if you read one of these books, these accounts of Jesus' earthly life, you'll see that how He loved and how He listened to people, how He made time for people, how He spoke the truth in love, how He uh, asked questions, how He told stories to illustrate God's kingdom purposes with astounding wisdom. We see where He shows grace and He miraculously intervenes to meet human need as the Spirit leads Him. We see how He treats people with dignity, even when others try to squeeze Him into their agenda and trap Him, He treats people with dignity. We see how He responds to betrayal and rejection and legal trial and torture and we see how He forgives and prays for His enemies. We see how He always trusts and honours His Father. And it's just breathtaking. And you might be thinking, that's good, that's good. I'm I'm glad I've got that goal, but you know, that's Jesus and I know me. (laughs) I want you to keep listening because I believe this series is gonna be life-giving and transformative. The Lord is gonna breathe new life into our relationships. I prophesy that over all of us. He's gonna breathe new life into our relationships, not necessarily by changing every situation, but by changing you and I from the inside out, shaping us to be more like Jesus. And so there's a passage in Scripture in James 3 that I keep coming back to again and again because it shows me, it helps me determine where I'm looking more like Jesus and where I'm looking less. (laughs) And it gets my attention And I also find it useful in talking with people and walking alongside them as a friend and as a pastor saying, you know, where do you feel stuck? How do you wanna grow in some of your relationships? And encouraging them with the Word of God and praying for them, encouraging them that the Holy Spirit can help them. Let's read it together. It's in James 3, verse 13 to 18. I'm gonna read it in the Amplified. Who among you is wise and intelligent? Let him by his good conduct show his or her good deeds and the gentleness and humility of true wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be arrogant and as a result be in defiance of the truth. This superficial wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, secular, natural, or unspiritual, even demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder, unrest, rebellion, and every evil thing and morally degrading practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, morally and spiritually undefiled, then peace-loving, courteous, considerable, considerate, gentle, reasonable and willing to listen, full of compassion and good fruits. It is unwavering without self-righteous hypocrisy and self-serving guile. 
And the seed whose fruit is righteousness or spiritual maturity is sown in peace by those who make peace, by actively encouraging goodwill between individuals. The context for the book of James. James is like the New Testament version of Proverbs. He's writing to Christians. He's not writing to people on how to become a follower of Christ and saying you've got to do all these good things and all these good deeds so that you can come to God. He's saying, no, the only way we come to God is through Jesus Christ. But now that you're a Christ follower and he's writing to persecuted Christians who've been scattered throughout Judea, he's saying, now that you're a Christ follower, this is how practically you live in obedience to Jesus. This is what it looks like when rubber hits the road. This is what faith lived out looks like. I love this quote from Tim Keller. He says, properly understood, Christianity is by no means the opiate or drug of the people that we just use as an escape from the harsh reality of life. He said, it's more like the smelling salts. It's more like the smelling salts. I think that's so true. (laughs) If you don't want to know what smelling salts are, I'm gonna tell you. Smelling salts have been used as a medicinal tool since the 13th century. They were used frequently to prevent or help with fainting. Even though they've fallen out of common use, smelling salts are made of a chemical, usually ammonia, that has a very strong smell. So think that bleach smell if you're cleaning and you're using bleach. It's that kind of really strong, harsh smell. When smelling salts are put under the nose of someone who's fainted, the sharp smell causes them to wake up again. The fumes irritate the interior of the nose and the irritation causes the lungs to quickly breathe deeply to clear the nasal passage. And the thing about the gospel and the good news of Jesus is is, is actually a message that doesn't drug us and um, just make us, you know, think that reality is too hard so we're just gonna over here, over, go over here and play games and escape. The good news of Jesus wakes us up to the reality of what life is all about and what really matters. And so this message is a bit like smelling salts today, okay? (laughs) God is waking us up to what life-giving behaviours and attitudes He wants to continue to grow in our relationships. And this passage is gonna be a framework for the whole series. It's gonna be a helpful tool you can use to come back to, like I've said again and again, and look at more like Jesus, less like Jesus. Are you ready for the smelling salts? (laughs) I'm gonna read it again in the message, paraphrase this time. Do you wanna be counted wise to build a reputation for wisdom? Here's what you do. Live well, live wisely, live humbly. It's the way you live, not the way you talk that counts. Mean-spirited ambition isn't wisdom. Boasting that you're wise isn't wisdom. Twisting the truth to make yourselves sound wise isn't wisdom. It's the furthest thing from wisdom. It's animal cunning, devilish plotting. Whenever you're trying to look better than others or get the better of others, things fall apart and everyone ends up at the other's throats. Real wisdom, God's wisdom, begins with a holy life and is characterised by getting along with others. It's gentle and reasonable overflowing with mercy and blessings. Not hot one day and cold the next, not two-faced. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoys its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, of treating each other with dignity and honour. How we need God's wisdom for our relationships, for all of life. Because why? Information is not enough. We have access to so much information, more than any other generation that lived before us with the connected generations. We can Google anything. But information is not wisdom. Information is not wisdom. 
Real relationships take intentionality and a willingness to grow, often involve hard work and authentic conversations. And they require the Spirit's unlimited resources because our capacity to love others has its limit. You know that thing of, I can't do this anymore, I've had enough, I'm at the end of my rope, this is impossible. Yes! (laughs) Proverbs 9.10 says, the reverent fear of the Lord, that is worshipping Him and regarding Him as truly awesome is the beginning and the preeminent part of wisdom. It's the starting point and its essence. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding and spiritual insight. Proverbs 3, 13 to 17 says, Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire, nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, in her left hand are riches and honour. Her ways are pleasant and all her paths are peace. Wow. And in Colossians it says, Paul's writing that we might know the mystery of God, namely Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Wow. C.S. Lewis said, all that is not eternal is eternally out of date. You might have been one cool hipster in the 70s. All right? But your kids and your grandkids look at you and think, hmm, not sure about that one. (laughs) If you think you're so hot right now, teenagers and young adults, you wait 20 years. You wait, you wait. (laughs) You're gonna get a few eye rolls, like what are you doing? (laughs) All that is not eternal is eternally out of date. We come back to who God is and what He says about relationship. Let's read James one more time, this time in the NIV. I want us to soak in this passage this morning. Who is wise and understanding among you, let them show up by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, and peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. The big idea in this passage is that wisdom in relationships looks like goodness. It says, let them show it by their good deeds. Wisdom in relationship looks like humility with the humility that comes from wisdom. Wisdom in relationships looks like purity of heart. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. If you wanna know what being more like Jesus looks like in your relationship, it looks like growing in goodness humility and purity of heart. And so I wanna talk about that, the goodness of Jesus, the goodness of Jesus. Luke 24 talks about this amazing encounter that happened on Jesus' big day. It's His resurrection, it's His big day. It's like everything that He said about Himself, every claim that He said about Himself has been vindicated. The grave couldn't hold him, like he's alive. And you would think, being alive, that he would think, right, I'm gonna go visit Caiaphas, high priest. You think I was just being blasphemous, (laughs) ta-da! Check this out, I'm actually real, like I'm actually overcome death, like I'm not just making this up, I'm not some pretender. Look at my arms, what I went through, look at my side, hello. Does he do that? No. He rocks up to two guys who are walking on a dusty road to a place called Emmaus. And he just walks with them. He doesn't even do the ta-da thing with them. He's just like, hey guys, what's happening? And they're like, haven't you heard? (laughs) He 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 says to them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. And they're like, 
Like what planet have you been on? Haven't you heard about Jesus of Nazareth and how He died and we, we thought He was the one. We thought He was the one who was gonna redeem us and set us free and politically restore our nation. And Jesus doesn't even do the ta-da thing then. He says, what things? He listens to them. He listens to their pain. And then it says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He gives them an amazing Bible lesson. Wow. Jesus continues on as if he's going further, but they urge him strongly, stay with us. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognise him and he disappears. And they run back and tell the 11 um, disciples who, was, who were there and say, we've seen the Lord and they're talking about this. And as they're talking about this, Jesus Himself appears among them. Jesus is good. He's so good. He walked the dusty road with two heartbroken disciples when He could have rocked up to all the powerful people who rejected Him and said, see, I was right. What does goodness look like? Goodness is action. It's not something we do only for the sake of being virtuous. When we strive to be good only for our own benefit, it's not truly goodness that we possess. In Greek, the word goodness means an uprightness of heart and life, excellence of character in your dealings with people. Goodness is expressed in kindness, and other praiseworthy qualities. It includes avoiding evil and springs from the inner person. When I think of goodness, I think of my friend Michaela Hunter, who's moved to Canberra. She just goes about doing good, buying people a present, making a meal. She doesn't draw attention to it. She just does lots of little good things that bless people. When I think of goodness, I think of someone in our church family like Jean Zumas. Just makes time for people, has coffee with people, rings people up, just always listening, always pointing them to Jesus, just thinking of ways and acts of kindness that she can do good because she has to. What about online? We live in this shame cancel culture that writes people off. Maybe you sit behind your keyboard and express your opinion, but is it good? Is it good? If you want to know someone who <clears throat> handles this so well, Dr. John Dixon, who's an Australian historian, he's just been given a, a job at Wheaton College um, as a professor and he does an Underceptions podcast. He's amazing, but he gets trashed. Like people literally, you read the comments, it's horrible what they write, but he's always gracious and good. He'll talk about the idea, he'll challenge the idea, but the way he just finds a way to be good, the tone of it is really beautiful. Romans 12, 21 says, do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. And that's a word for some of you. You cannot control, change or manipulate someone else into changing. You're only responsible for your own thoughts, feelings and responses. With the power of Christ helping you, you can choose to do good. And so when you're saying right now, as you're thinking about a relationship that you struggle with, Lord, you've been so good to me. How can I do good to this person? <clears throat> the humility of Jesus. In John 13, the most beautiful picture of Jesus' humility, the King of Kings washes His disciples' feet. <clears throat> In verse 12, when He'd finished washing their feet, He put on His clothes and returned to His place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. You know, humility changes how we view ourselves. 
It's not thinking less of yourself. It's not about indecisiveness or insecurity or inferiority. It's about thinking of yourself less. When we're humble, our goal is not to exalt ourselves, especially over other people. Instead of manoeuvring for the respect of others, which is pride, we give them our respect by recognising their intrinsic God-given worth. And because they have intrinsic God-given worth, we serve them. We humble ourselves to serve them. They're made in the image of God. Jesus thought they were worth dying for. Philippians 2, 1 to 5 says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement for being united with Christ, any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and, one, and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He took on the nature of a servant. He humbled himself. Do you know if you don't humble yourself, God will humble you? Who's had that experience before? (laughs) It's not as pleasant as humbling yourself. (laughs) He took the appearance of nature of a servant, he humbled himself. Developing the identity, attitude and conduct of a humble servant John Stott says this, it does not happen overnight. It is rather like peeling an onion. You cut away one layer only to find another beneath it. But it does happen as we forsake pride and seek to humble ourselves by daily deliberate choices in dependence on the Holy Spirit. Humility grows in our soul. I want you to think about a very difficult relationship that you have, taking in mind what I said earlier about the context of boundaries when there's abuse happening, but you recognise my intrinsic God-given worth by dying in my place, Jesus. Who is it that God is saying to you, humble yourself and recognise this person's God-given worth and serve them? very quiet in this room. We're all doing a lot of thinking, smelling salts. (laughs) Okay, Jesus' purity of heart. Finish with this. In Luke 22, it says, while he was still speaking, a crowd came up and the man who was called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Jesus is highlighting to Judas wake up, do you really realise what you're doing? He says, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was gonna happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And without even waiting for an answer from Jesus, we know who it was, Peter, who says, I'm not gonna wait for an answer. And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. It's amazing to me. I don't think he just healed Malchus's ear and stuck it back on because he wanted to protect his disciples. I think he's the last miracle he did before he went to the cross and he saw this man who was his enemy, a servant of the high priest who would have to go back to Caiaphas and say, okay, listen, I know we thought Jesus was a crazy man, but he stuck my ear back on. I think he loved him. And just out of the purity of his heart, wanted to bless him, the one who's arresting him. Wow. Being more like Jesus in our relationship starts with the purity of heart. 
A purity of heart is single-mindedness in the way we relate to God and one another, characterised by sincerity and genuineness without self-serving guile or deceitful cunning. John Stott says, someone whose purity has purity of heart, their very heart, including their thoughts and motives, are pure, unmixed with anything devious, ulterior or base. Hypocrisy and deceit are abhorrent to them. In James 3, 17, it says, but the wisdom of heaven is first of all pure. The end of verse 17, it says, in the Amplified, it's unwavering without self-righteous hypocrisy and self-serving guile. Jesus' purity of heart shone through when Peter's impulsive, fearful anger and rage reared its ugly head. Jesus could have called on His Father for 12 legions of angels to come and rescue Him and wiped out all of His enemies. He could have wiped out the entire planet. Instead, He chose the Father's will, even in that moment when He had a lot of other things on His mind. He said, I see you, Malchus, and I love you. And I'm, by the way, I'm gonna stick your ear back on. <clears throat> he was unwavering in His mission and character. He showed mercy to someone who did not deserve it. Is Jesus saying to you today about an error in your life or a way that you're unthinkingly respond in some of your relationships? Is He saying to you, no more of this? Will you ask Him to search your own heart and your anxious thoughts, even just now as you're sitting there? those things you fear, those impulses that make you wanna go on the defensive and react or run away? Will you invite him to firstly examine your own part in any conflict or misunderstanding? What do you need to own? Do you need to forgive as the Lord has forgiven you? How might you need to apologise or speak the truth in love so that where possible you can reconcile? or set appropriate boundaries for unacceptable behaviour. Because you could listen to this whole message and think, I've just got to do better. I've got to be gooder. I've got to be more humble. And I've got to be like really pure in my heart. (laughs) But the goal is not trying harder. The good news is we can be more like Jesus. Have a listen to this quote. Again, by John Stott, Christ-likeness in our own strength is clearly not attainable, but God has given us His Holy Spirit to dwell within us. William Temple, Archbishop in the 1940s, used to illustrate this point from Shakespeare. It's no good giving me a play like Hamlet or King Lear and telling me to write a play like that. Shakespeare could do it, I can't. And it's no good showing me a life like the life of Jesus and telling me to live a life like that. Jesus could do it, but I can't. But if the genius of Shakespeare could come and live in me, then I could write a play like this. And if the Spirit of Jesus could come and live in me, then I could live a life like that or more like that. Can you say amen to that? I mean, the Spirit of God, the same power that raised Christ from the dead has come to live in any who put their trust in Jesus. It's a resurrection power. It's not a grave tending power. It's not just keeping and going through the motions. It's a power that beyond your limitations has the power to love. Beyond your limitations has the power to be gracious. Beyond your limitations has the power to endure. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, we can be mirrors that brightly reflect the glory of the Lord and as the Spirit of the Lord works within us. Even when I can't see it, what? You're working. Even when I don't feel it, what? You're working. We just cooperate and say, God, work in me. As the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like Him. In Hebrews 4, 13 to 14, it says, Jesus understands every weakness of ours because He was tempted in every way that we are, but He did not sin. So whenever we're in need, we should come bravely before the throne of our merciful God. There, we will be treated with undeserved grace and we will find help. 
What a friend we have in Jesus, right? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this smelling salts kind of word today. We need them. Sometimes they're not easy to hear, but it's easy to deceive ourselves. It's easy to become complacent. It's easy to just go through the motions sometimes. And you come through your word and by your spirit and you wake us up. but you don't condemn us. You don't point the accusing finger. You come to help because you're the friend that sticks closer than a brother. You sent the Spirit of your Son to come and live in the hearts of any who put their trust in Christ. And if you don't know Jesus today, you've never put your trust in Him, you've never invited Him and said yes to the offer of relationship that He gives you, Today is your day. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day where you can say, Jesus Christ, I didn't really know much about You, but far out, You love me so much and You lay down Your life for me. And You didn't sin. It wasn't Your sin that put You on that cross. It was my sin. And I see it and I'm sorry, Lord. And I thank You, Lord, for Your forgiveness. Come into my life now and lead me. And help me to follow You. I wanna be a child of God. I turn from trusting in myself and from that old way of living and I turn my heart towards You. And I say, make me new, Jesus. If you prayed that prayer, it doesn't matter so much about the words, but if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, Jesus Christ has come into your life by the power of His Spirit. You are a brand new creature in Christ. The old has gone and the new has come. The power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives in you and He's gonna help you to follow Jesus every step of the way. Hallelujah.